Okay, so I thought I'd post a quick video about the Zcam E2. Um, as some of you know, you've seen my test, I've been posting about it. Um, I originally wanted to shoot anamorphic with the Vazen lens on the Pocket 4K. I still love the Pocket 4K, but for anamorphic, I prefer the Zcam E2 because of the height of the sensor. Um, it just looks much better to me. So yeah, I thought I'd talk to you guys like this rather than setting up you know, me sat down talking to you guys, you know, professionally, whatever you want to call it. Um, I just felt it just, it's just more laid back this way. Anyways, there's the baby over there. So I have got the small rig set up. Um, all of this small rig, uh, the lens is a beauty, uh, port keys monitor. I did have the, uh, Shinobi monitor, which is still really good, but the fact that I can use the touch screen to, you know, to work the cameras just, just makes sense. So it just went that way. Um, anyways, I will dive into some footage and some tips of how to shoot with the camera. So I won't go into a crazy amount of detail, but those used to like Panasonic cameras where you can customize, you know, your buttons for your profiles or how fast it is, you know, in Blackmagic cameras to change your frames per second. That's the only downside about this camera is like you can't really use it for running gun like that where you, you're super fast on changing your settings. Um, I mean, grateful that they do have them. It's just, it's just kind of slow. So when I first got it, I thought I can, you know, customize these to set up, uh, you know, the profiles, but you can't really set this up as like 4k 60 or 4k 120 and then, you know, 1080 super 16 or whatever. Um, you kind of have to use it as one button to go into the profiles in the menu and then change it, which is fine. But going through those profiles, it's slow. So let me show you. Okay, so for example, right here, I've got everything set up to anamorphic mode, just 25p. And on my function two button down here on the camera, um, I've got it set to the profile. So if I push it, it comes up with the menu and I can select which profile I want. Uh, so this one would be my anamorphic mode that I'm in now. And if I go down to select it, this will go into anamorphic into 50p. Now, as I said, if you're doing it on the pocket camera, you know, you're just sliding around the menu, you're just super quick. Um, and with Panasonic cameras, you know, you just set your custom buttons and you, you push it and you're in there. So watch how long it takes. I want to load the profile. See, to me, that's just a tiny bit too long. It's fine, but like if you, like I said, if you're running gun, anything like that, you're going to miss some shots. So yeah, not sure what's going on because usually brings up the menu here and nothing is happening. I'm going to the cable real quick. Turn it off back on. Usually works for everything. <laughs> okay, here we go. It's going to be gold. And wait for it. Please work. No, no. So a fun little thing as I'm trying to show you something, the camera is playing up. So normally I click menu on the monitor and it shows up on the monitor, but it's not doing that. Uh, so I'll have to show you it this way. Uh, so basically the menu settings as I was talking about to jump through, which are pretty quick, um, but they don't load quick, is you basically, you set up your um, settings. So you set up your, you, you know, anamorphic mode, 25p, uh, 50p, whatever you want first. So mine's just 25p. So we jump down, the D squeeze is already, you know, supposedly set up. Um, so we click in here in the settings and the first thing you want to do is to set up the button profile. So mine is F2. You can have it, whatever you want. Um, F2 is down there. And then you click that to be load your profiles. So as I mentioned, it'd be much quicker if when you push F1, that was anamorphic push F2, anamorphic slow-mo, F3, you know, spherical, 120 frames per second, whatever you want. That would be much quicker, kind of how we're used to setting up cameras. But instead, you have to push the function button to load a menu of the profile. So it's a bit slow that way. So first set up that button. Um, and then when you go back, you now want to do the user profile. So you click OK. So this one is set up. So you want to save that. And when you click Save, you choose which profiles you want. Click and cancel because mine's already set up. Um, so you just do that through all your profiles. And then that way, when the camera's on, you push F2, select which profile you want saved, and then you're good to go. But as I mentioned, it's annoying and it's just very slow. So just be prepared for that if you're used to, especially that magic cameras. Do another example. I think I got the fourth one down. 
I'll show you what I'm looking at in a second. Uh, I don't know why it's not coming up here because I got my cable plugged in. Uh, so let's go to this one, which I think is 1080p Super 16 mode. See, this one's taking a while. See, this is the slightly annoying thing about this camera is when I saved this, I obviously didn't save it as anamorphic mode, uh, de-squeezed in camera. I wanted it to be, you know, 16 by nine, rather your spherical lenses. But because I got the settings up here, it's forcing it into anamorphic mode. Okay, so here's another thing I like to set up in the monitor. Um, you can do this in the Shinobi as well, uh, but this is how I set up in the port keys. Um, so as you know, I like to shoot anamorphic, but sometimes clients don't necessarily like the wide aspect ratio, but they might like the character of anamorphics. I know I definitely do still delivering anamorphic 16 by nine. Um, still looks cool, still has a cool look. Um, loads of shows shoot that way. Um, Narcos is one of them um, among many others. Uh, but anyways, yeah, you jump into the menu at the top here and in the guides, what I've got set up is, so I did it on custom and I've got 84 by 80. And basically this is what you're recording in the camera. So this is your 3K, whatever, anamorphic um, 1.8 times, which is awesome that the camera de-squeezes that because the black magic still doesn't. So you have to look at a weird two times crop. Uh, I won't go into that. Anyways, so what this is set up, the guide, so if I turn them off, you'll see what I'm talking about. Okay, so I just turned it off um, and I'm back on. Um, so as I said, I got it to 84 by 80. And so what that does for your comfort is, you know you're recording in this frame and the 84 by 80 is exactly if you wanna put it in a 38, 40 by 2160 timeline and you'll get the bars in the top and the, you know, in the bottom um, with a bigger frame for anamorphic. So if you frame, um, so basically if you're shooting anamorphic mode but you you wanna be careful of how you're delivering, that and that will be perfectly on the edges how you see it here in a 38, 38, 40 by 2160 timeline. And then if you don't want to deliver that way, you're still delivering anamorphic. You can see how you're framing for that. And so far that 84 by 80 in the guides has worked out absolutely perfect. Um, I highly recommend it if you want to shoot that way. And it's good practice for you to, you know, shoot anamorphic and deliver that way. Anyways, because it just looks really cool. It looks really nice. Oh yeah, one more quick tip uh, about focusing with anamorphic um, because shooting full frame and being out of focus is a pain. So shooting anamorphic um, shallow is also a pain. So you want to be extra careful of your focus. So what I normally do is I have the peaking on in camera and I just roll that way. And then anytime it's a tricky scene or say you're just exhausted by shooting all day, I then have peaking on top of the camera and then I just push that and it just gives me that extra, you know, confirmation of where I am. But most of the time I'm fine, as you can see with peaking, just in the camera. But if you want the extra confidence, you're just bam, major peaking. And then you, you know, you're just good to go. Okay, so here's how I like to work with the anamorphic footage in Premiere Pro, whether it's the, you know, the E2 camera or the pocket camera. Um, so, you, you know, you normally grab your clips, go to clip, you go to modify, interpret footage, annoyingly, Premiere Pro does not have 1.8 times. So the quickest way is just to click two times. Do not use two times because it looks disgusting because it's 1.8 times. Uh, just click whatever. Um, let me just show you a bad example real quick. So this is just the Ultra HD timeline. This is 3840 by 2160. Um, so you grab the clip, you throw it in, let Premiere Pro you know change it for you. So as you can see, we're too stretched. It just looks weird. Um, obviously it's flat uh, profile. So what you want to do is because it's 1.8 times, you just want to click on the uniform scale and just literally just click the width, just go to 90 and that's the correct 1.8 times D squeeze. Um, I don't know why Premiere Pro or other programs don't have it. It's simple to quickly do. Um, but now we've got edges, so it just looks stupid. Um, so rather than tell you the mathematics of changing the sequence settings, um, all you have to do for your profile is create your, your new sequence, do your settings. And what I got mine set to, as you can see, it's 3326 by 2772, anamorphic 2.0, whatever frames a second you shot in. Uh, and then you want this to be QuickTime ProRes 422 and have that to be the same. So when you click OK, 
and then now you drag that clip in don't change it just click keep existing and then now when you change it to 100 by 90 you perfectly in your timeline and it looks absolutely perfect uh, so this go to another way of doing the Ultra HD that was mentioned earlier. So we've got the Ultra HD timeline. So I've already got my own mats that I use to, to display it properly to have the bars on the top and bottom. And I basically just drag that in my Ultra HD timeline, stretch it, and we want it to be multiply. So when the footage is in there. And now when you drag your footage in and you click, 90%. It's too big, so you've lost loads of footage, but we've got all this footage to work with to scale it back down. Um, so in a Ultra HD timeline, so in a normal anamorphic mode that I showed you with this setting and the sequence settings, 100 by 90, that's your 1.8 times squeeze. Now if you want that in an Ultra HD timeline with the bars top and bottom, all you need to do is type on the top, we want this to be 70 and we want that to be 63. And there, that is anamorphic in Ultra HD timeline. So you still have, still have the character of the anamorphic lens, but you're just delivering it for TV, so it's more acceptable to them. I mean, TV's more like, you know, widespread of how they like to do things now anyway, so you will see anamorphic stuff on there. Um, but I personally like this look as well. It's a good way to, to mix things up if you still want you know, you don't want that pin sharp footage, you want some characters to it. This is a good way to edit as well. Um, and you've got all this room to shift your footage about, you know, how you want to frame and stuff. But obviously, so yeah, that's basically how I like to set that up with those settings. Okay, so another thing you must purchase when getting this lens is their little adapter ring to go on the front, which is a must have in my opinion. And it's just a 95 millimeter ring and it goes on the front like that. Um, and just allows you, hold up two secs. It allows you to um, attach diopters, ND filters. Obviously they're a little bit more expensive because you need a 95 millimeter ring, um, but it just makes it more compact of a rig rather than doing the whole matte box style. So let me show you the ND and the diopters that I got. So I did, I highly recommend these. These are by Vivitar and can't do this with one anything up. Shit. So yeah, as you can see, um, you got a, a plus one, a plus two, a plus four, and a plus 10. Um, in my opinion, the plus one and the plus two are the most used ones that I find. Um, it just does a really good job. But just bear in mind, as you see these tests, that when you put these on, yes, you will get close focus, and it's much better. And it's still very sharp from all the tests that I've done with other lenses. It's very sharp, and these filters are very nice to use. Um, just remember that your minimum focus and your maximum focus distance changes. It's not the same as what the lens is now. So obviously the lens you got infinity to whatever it is, four feet or something. Um, that completely changes when you put these on. So you definitely will not get infinity with these. So don't think, you know, oh, amazing, I can get close focus and I do affinity. You lose all that distance as well. So in the test here that you can see, I'm showing you that the maximum close distance and the maximum, you know, infinity distance. So you know what you're gonna get out of these lenses. So when you're running around or when you're setting up shots, you know your actor's not gonna hit a spot and you're like, nope, I'm completely in the wrong spot. So uh, just to, to give you a rough idea of what's going on with that. So ND wise, um, there's actually quite a lot out there now for just strict ND. I hate variable ND, so apologies if you expected to get some variable ND kind of thing. Um, so I normally use format high tech IRND filters, um, especially for Blackmagic cameras, um, and they work amazing. Um, but I already have, you know, a bunch of 82 millimeter ones, and their 95 millimeter ones are like, I, would, I think they're like 200 pound, you know, one ND. And obviously, with straight ND, you need a couple of different variants. So <laughs> it's a lot of money. So I searched around and I picked up Gobe, and there's another company called Lucid. Um, my other one of these hasn't arrived, it got lost, which is awesome. Um, so the strengths that I got now is an ND64 and a 0 0.6, and those are working good so far. I need to get a, maybe a, a 1 or 1.2, um, and they work great. You can stack them, and in my test so far, the quality is absolutely superb. So if you need straight ND, 
go with gobe or lucid um, and they're more affordable i think this one was like 50 60 bucks and this one maybe 70 bucks Okay, so that's pretty much it. I hope it helps you out. Um, as I mentioned, I love the camera. I really, really love that lens. Um, there is word, obviously, that they're bringing out full frame lenses. Uh, I kind of hope they're expensive because if they're not, I'll be a little bit annoyed because I've invested in Micro Four Thirds. But I think they're going to be more expensive just because it's, it's more to make of the glass and covering those sensors. But um, anyways, if you're interested in that lens, I really do highly recommend it. And if you are going Micro Four Thirds, even if you are a Pocket 4K user, invest in the Z cam because the height of the sensor and just the way that it looks anamorphic and uh, yeah so that's about it I'll check you guys next time and it feels kind of weird vlogging but I'll see you guys later